what is your favorite Bible translation, and are you confident that it has been translated accurately? The Bible has been translated in over 2,000 different languages, and there are nearly 90 different completed translations in the English language alone. On our show today, we have Dr. John Oswald from Asbury Seminary. He is one of the translators for the New Living Translation of the Bible, which is one of my personal favorites. He is also a professor of Old Testament studies and a prolific writer who has written an extensive commentary on the book of Isaiah, as well as other books exploring whether the Bible is simply another piece of literature among the ancient myths or something more. So join us as we discuss how the New Living Translation came alive and begin to uncover the uniqueness of the Old Testament God among his contemporaries. Today, our guest is Dr. John Oswald from Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. Um, we're so glad to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. And also, we still have our, our co-host, Max Aka. What's up? Great. And uh, we're gonna, just going to do a little bit of an introduction, both of you, because we did a podcast last week. Max is here. He is a theologian, um, but I just want... Sorts. <laughs> of sorts. <laughs> and I just want our audience to, to get to know um, both of you. So, John, let's start with you. Yes, a little, little, little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I am an Old Testament teacher. Sometimes people call me a scholar. I'm not entirely sure that I'm a scholar. I'm, I'm a student, I hope. Mm. Uh, but, but what I do is teach. That's uh, uh, years ago when I was in college, many years ago, one of my professors uh, said to me, John, you should consider teaching. And at that point, I was headed for the mission field. And I said, mm. oh, no, no, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm called to missions. Well, in subsequent years, while I was in seminary, I felt a real call into teaching. And uh, a number of years later, I was back at my uh, college, and uh, she was still there. And she looked at me with a twinkle in her eye and said, John, do you remember a conversation? And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, Dr. Butts, I do remember. Mm. And uh, so I teach. And it's... Um, a professor years ago said in my hearing, well, if they wouldn't pay me to teach, I'd have to pay them to let me teach. Wow. And that's where I am. Wow. That's awesome. We need teachers like you to be doing this. Max, a little bit about yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Max, a uh, full-time professional human. Yes. I've been at that for 28 <laughs> years now. Wow. You're an expert I've, now. I'm really good at being a human. <laughs> uh, seminary student here at Andrews. Uh, Part-time, sometimes I open my mouth and notes come out. Sometimes they're on pitch. Yeah, and I write good. a blog here as well for uh, I, I Believe, believe Bible. Bible. Good. Awesome. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, that's yeah, we'll leave, we'll leave it at that. Great. That's good. You can find out more about Max on I Believe Bible. <laughs> Not really, actually. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like stay on He's the it. ghost behind like, it. I hope they find out about Jesus a little bit. Yeah. Not that's so much idea. me. I'm not in the Bible, interestingly. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh. It took me a while before I realized. <laughs> I kept reading myself into it, and I was like, yeah. I'm not there. So, you know. <laughs> well, Dr. Oswald, we're so glad to have you today. Thank you. I So, you were part of the New Living Translation of the Bible. Yes. That's fantastic. I have uh, the Inspire version with the uh, drawings on the side and the notes. I love it. So, Great. how did you get involved in that, and what was your contribution to this? project? Well, the original Living Bible was done by Dr. Ken Taylor, and um, it sold over 40 million copies. Wow. But every time people referred to it, somebody would say, yeah, but it's just a paraphrase, mm. which it was. So the people at Tyndall House Publishers, which uh, the company was actually formed to publish the Living Bible, hmm. they said, is it possible to keep that sort of crispness, that readability, and yet have it be a translation. Mm. Mm. So they contacted uh, Dr. Grant Osborne, who taught New Testament at Trinity for many years, and said, uh, do you think it's possible to find some people who would be willing to work on this project? And he said, yeah. So I happened to be teaching Trin at Trinity at that time and had just con finished my two-volume commentary on Isaiah. And so Grant said, and I very well remember the day he came mm. into my office and he said, John, would you be willing to be in charge of the prophets if we work on this project? Wow. And it took me about 30 seconds to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite an honor. It was, it yeah. was. And there were... <clears throat> The, the team was made up, I've got to get my numbers right here now. I think, think I'm right. It, there were 12 people on the team. 
six of us were uh, Bible scholars. Uh, uh, Dr. Block, who was the um, editor for the Pentateuch, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Beitzel, who was the editor for the historical books, Dr. Longman, who was the editor for the poetic books, I was editor for the prophets, uh, Grant Osborne was for the gospels and acts, and uh, Dr. Norman Erickson was the editor for the um, epistles and revelation. Mm -hmm. So that was six of us. Then there were four from um, the Tyndale House uh, who were, one was an, their New Testament coordinator, another the Old Testament coordinator, one the associate editor, and one the president, and the final one was Dr. Taylor. And so they treated us so very, very well. They, when it began, they thought we would be able to do it in a series of long weekends, mm. but no. We, oh. we did two of those and we said, this is not going to work. Right. And they said, uh, well, okay, how about uh, could we do, say, three weeks early in the summer? Well, at that point, all of us had uh, either young children or teenage children, and we said, nope, we can't be away for three weeks. Yeah. Mm. They said, well, how about we take you to a nice place and bring your families along. All right. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So right. Right. They, they did it early in June, yeah. which, which is the downtime in almost all kinds of resorts. So mm. we were at Aspen. Mm. We were at Whistler in Canada. Mm. We were in... Uh, uh, so how does this process happen? Because I feel like a lot of people kind of are skeptical of some of the newer translations. They feel like this isn't uh, really being true to the text, or how do we know that it's true? So how does that process happen? So giving some of our listeners yeah. an insight into that. Yeah. From the outset, uh, it was determined this is going to be a thought-for-thought thought commentary, uh, excuse me, translation. Hmm. Because... In fact, translation is a lot more complicated than most people have any idea because when you move from one language to another, it's very rare for there to be an exact equivalent word mm. in the other language for the one you're working with. Mm. Uh, and this is especially true for Hebrew, which has a very small vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And so you have 10 or 12 possible meanings on a given Hebrew word. Mm -hmm. And you can't find one English word that gets that. Right. And so that was really the decision that we're going to capture the thought. Mm -hmm. So one of the people on our committee was an English stylist. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the six of us would argue around about, well, we, he'd say, okay, so, so what is it saying? Mm -hmm. And we would say, well, this, well, the way you say that in English is. Mm. And so oftentimes people uh, say, well, well, the New Living, that, that's not really a translation. It's not word for word. Mm. Well, yes, it is a translation. It's thought for thought. Mm. Mm -hmm. That sometimes complicates right. Bible study because maybe the way a word is used in Genesis is different from the way it's used in Isaiah. And so somebody gets a concordance out and say, no, wait a minute, you translated that word different over here than here. Mm. Well, yeah, it's in a different thought. Right. Mm. right. So that really was uh, the issue. But all, all six of us who were the scholars, uh, all of us were committed to inerrancy. Mm. All of us committed to the authority of the word. Mm. And uh, every one of us was just passionate about saying, what is the text saying? Wow. It sounds like you guys really took a lot of thought and, and care into that process. Yes. I feel like the New Living Translation is a really great version, especially for new beginners, because there's so much, I don't want to say like code language yeah. when you're reading yeah. the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult to discern. Please don't start them off in the King James. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> uh, where exactly. It's, where it's, ancient, it's like reading Beowulf, like, you know, it's old English. Exactly. We don't understand it. Exactly. Uh, this is very present and modern, and I like the distinction. It's thought for thought. If you want to do, you know, word for word, there's other translations, yeah. but this is good for that particular exactly. area. Exactly. Yeah. So what we did, and it was, it was kind of interesting, with each of the six of us, when we looked at our passages, 
it broke into fives. Hmm. Pentateuch, of course, there are five. <laughs> but also, and I, I won't bore you with all the, the numbers and figures, but it was the same, for instance, in my area, I had the four major prophets counting lamentations with Jeremiah, mm -hmm. mm. and then the 12, the, mm. the okay. 12 minor prophets, five. Mm. So in each case, I recruited three guys. So for instance, Isaiah, mm. uh, guys or gals, and their job was to go through the living Bible and to say, okay, this has got to be changed our, our mantra was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. Uh, this is broken. <laughs> yeah. This this doesn't really capture what the Hebrew is saying here. And to propose changes. Mm. So I got three sets of changes on Isaiah. Wow. And then my job was to go through that and Synthesize combine those, it. yes, mm. into a single document. That document then was given to our committee of 12. Mm. And we would spend three weeks Wow. Banging through that. Wow. And it's every one of us have said, and I've, I've heard everyone say it, uh, this was the most satisfying mm. aspect of my professional career. Wow. Uh, wow. To sit at a table with 12 people who love God and love the word yeah. and just bang it out and say, oh, that's not what it's saying. Right, right. <laughs> yes, it is. Here's why. <laughs> and what's so great about this is that it's a it's a coalition of people coming together. Yes, it's not yes. a single that's right. person making that's a translation. Right. It's many heads that's coming right. together. That's right. That's right. And it one of, and, and again, I've I've heard all the guys say this. Dr. Ken Taylor, you know, the Living Bible was his baby. Mm. I, <laughs> he did that thing. He he had uh, ten children. Mm. And they would have family devotions every night. Mm -hmm. And they were using the King James. Mm. So every night when he got done reading, the kids would say, what's that mean? Mm. And he would tell them. And they would say, well, why don't you say that then? Mm. <laughs> so he was working as an editor with a Moody Press in Chicago, lived out in Wheaton. So every morning and every evening, he had 45 minutes on the train. Wow. Mm. He wrote out tonight's passage. Mm. <laughs> right. And... It was his baby. Wow. So here we are, 11 of the rest of us, yeah. tearing arms and legs off his baby. Right. Yeah. And he was just so gracious wow. and, and so humble. Uh, many times we would have a, <laughs> a long discussion and finally it would put to a vote. Hmm. And it would be 11 to 1. Wow. He would be the one. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's but like, no. When yeah. it's over, yeah. it was over. Wow. That's so good. all of us, all of us just uh, really gained a tremendous appreciation mm. for his humility and his grace. And That's fantastic. What, um, what versions of the Greek and Hebrew were you guys coming from? Oh, actually, you were coming from his translation. So he was, already, he was just taking from the King James and tr paraphrasing it? Yeah, although he, he had uh, some Greek and Hebrew okay. that he knew. But, but basically, yeah, mm -hmm. he's working with the King James. Mm -hmm. but, but we were in, in every case. So, so with me, I'm, I've, got, I've got these guys' suggestions. I've got the Living Bible, and I've got my Hebrew text. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying... Yeah. Is what's here matching? Does that work in Hebrew? Wow. And sometimes, sometimes I might want to say, well, you know, I would say that a little differently from Hebrew than our revised text, but but that gets it. Hmm. And so so again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. And that's that's part of why there are two editions of it. Uh, many people are not aware. There's, oh, that's a, there's a 1996 edition. That's the mm. first edition. Then there's a second edition. Because as mm. we got into it, there were more times when we were saying, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's okay, but it would be better if. Right. And Tyndale said, okay, let's do that. Mm. Let's go ahead and, and do simply the, the cleanup of the Living Bible. But then... Let's go a little farther than that. Wow. Mm. And that's a huge project. I mean, I think the Bible is like the number one selling book in the world for, yes. since forever. <laughs> forever. Yes. Yes. Uh, so 
I, I can't say enough about uh, the, the current president is Mark Taylor, who's the son of Ken Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just, I can't say enough about their grace and the amount of money that they committed to this thing. I mean, it mm -hmm. was, it was, hmm. we're going to do whatever it takes here right. and not pinch pennies and, and try to cut corners. It was no, wow. remarkable. This is the word of God. It sounds like it's a great topic to really discuss how inspiration happens because there's some people who really believe in word for word inspiration uh, when, when the prophets of the Old Testament were writing. But really what you're doing is more what they were doing. It was thought inspiration. I think that's right. And, and, and that's really, this, this gets complicated, but one of the diff big differences between the biblical prophets and the pagan prophets the pagan prophet is possessed, mm. Mm. and they speak words they don't even know they're speaking, mm. and they are the words of the God, supposedly. Mm. Mm. But the biblical prophets are not possessed. Mm. They are filled. Mm. And what that means is it's the same thing filling them, but each container is different. Mm. So Isaiah is different from Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. different tone, different language, but it's the same God. Right. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and to me, that's the wonderful story of our Christian lives. Uh, each of us can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't make us carbon copies. Right. Right. We're all different, but it's the same Spirit filling us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you see then, that uh, the God that Jeremiah is describing and, and loving <laughs> and sometimes hating <laughs> is the same God that Isaiah is depicting in a kind of, kind of classic lyrical Hebrew. Mm. But it's the same God. Mm. And, and you know that. And this is, you know, uh, we may get into this later, but, but the difference between the Bible and all the other literature of the ancient world, just the simple idea of one God. Mm. Mm. Right. This is the only place, mm -hmm. the only place that it is maintained in a consistent way from end to end. Mm. Uh, you've got it springing up as an idea here and there in Greek culture, in Egyptian culture. Socrates. and Yeah, yeah. but nobody right. is able to hold it together as the unifying principle mm. running through from end to end. Right. And that says inspiration. Wow. Yeah. But I think, I think you're absolutely right that the, the miracle of inspiration is that God inspires these people then to tell what they have heard in their own language in such a way that nothing is lost from what they've heard from God. Mm. Right. And and your specialty is the Old Testament. Yes. And so I think that's pretty interesting because we live in a culture, and we were talking about this during the break, that the, the Old Testament is not PC, you right. know, and right. it's a very difficult part of the Bible for lay people or other people to look and say, why would I worship a God like this? This is barbaric. This is violent. Uh, what would you say to those who are wrestling with kind of the Old Testament and seeing a God that does not look loving, um, but looks, uh, you know, pretty monstrous by some accounts? <laughs> well, <laughs> how many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the first thing that I would want to say is the... Old Testament is remarkable among holy books mm -hmm. in that other holy books are simply statements, mm. descriptions. The God says this, the God says that. And you've just got these basically unrelated or collections of unrelated statements supposedly from God. Mm. The only thing like that in the Bible is Proverbs. Right. But even Proverbs is in a setting. So what God has chosen to do is to reveal himself through the life experience of a people. Mm. Where else? Right. Where else? Uh, Mahatma Gandhi is supposed to have said to the uh, missionary E. Stanley Jones, You're, it, the Bible can't be a holy book. It's got all these stories in it. Mm. 
But that's precisely what makes it a remarkable holy book Mm -hmm. because God has chosen to speak to these people in their context, in their time. He doesn't demand that they somehow get out of their context, move into another world and do something else, but he accommodates himself to them. Mm. Well, that means that because it's a long time ago, their life setting is going to be different from ours. Mm. I think one example, uh, the position of women. Mm. Women in the Old Testament are indeed functioning at a lower level than the men. Mm. That was part of that world, as it has been part of most of the world for most of its history. But the interesting thing is, in the Bible, compared to its own time frame, the women are elevated. Hmm. It was progressive for not, its time. Not to yeah. where our level is, right. but compared to where they were. Exactly. Hmm. One of the things I often think about is, you know, the, the situation where a woman has a right to bear a child to her husband. Hmm. Well, if her husband dies, her brother-in-law has to give her a child. Hmm. Now, my wife, Karen, has often said she's glad she doesn't live now. She sure would hate to have to marry her brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if that brother-in-law refuses to do it, mm. she has the right to spit in his face in public. Mm. Wow. She has a right, mm. and he has deprived her of that right. Mm. Wow. So it's, it's that that we have to constantly think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what was the situation that they were living in, right. and how has the Bible stepped up above that? Right. And, and I guess I would say it this way, how has God's intersection into that situation stepped it up? Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the interesting little thing, uh, when you come into the land and make war upon the uh, people there, you can't make war on the trees, Mm, yeah, that's <laughs> well, so weird. <laughs> yeah, because God's right. the creator. Right. They're his trees. Right. Mm. And they typically. bear fruit, and, and he's thinking of people in the land who are dependent upon that. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas typically, when an army came, that's the mm. first thing you did. Mm. You f- cut down every tree, every mm. possible means of support. Mm. You cut it down. Mm. And so that kind of thing, The uh, uh, you have to be careful about how you treat your animals. Mm -hmm. Right. So God coming into a situation, it changes. Mm. Right. That's true. That's, I mean, I think that that's a really great point to make that we're looking in the context of where they live. Yes. How God is really speaking and even elevating uh, people in that context. I mean, there's laws about rape. There's laws about all kinds of things that were probably more civilized uh, for that time than the laws in their current Yes. Dwellings. Yes. Yes. What would you say to people who are approaching the Old Testament, maybe with, uh, you know, modern presuppositions that are making it very difficult to get around kind of the shock factor that's there sometimes? What would you say to people who, you know, maybe don't have the, the luxury or the ability to get close to the Hebrew text? How, how do you encourage them to engage it? I know it's a bit of a broad question. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say, first of all, <laughs> get the New Living Translation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, get a very modern, readable translation. Mm. And and approach it as, as, how shall I say it, as unbiased as you can. Mm. Mm. And recognize that what God is doing here is he's laying a foundation. Mm. Look for that foundation, the one God. Mm. You can't make him in the shape of anything in this world. Mm. Uh, Look for how he uh, speaks to people in terms of that immediate access that he's giving. Look for all the places where God is incredibly patient. Hmm. One of the things that we often think of, well, man, God is mad at these people all the time. Well, he delivered them from Egypt Mm -hmm. by grace. 
Hmm. Just grace. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I've often said to students, you know, suppose Moses had shown up with the Torah, the law, okay. and said to the people in Egypt, okay, keep this perfectly for about 400 years and God will deliver you. <laughs> <laughs> They'd still be in Egypt. Right. right. He delivered them by sheer grace. Mm -hmm. Then he brings them to Sinai and he says, now, would you like for me to be your God? Mm. And they say, we're not dumb. Yeah, <laughs> we'd love for you to be our God. Okay, here's what I'm like. Mm. I value people's physical lives. Mm. Mm. I value their possessions. Mm -hmm. mm. I value their sexuality. Mm -hmm. I value their reputation. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. A teaching device. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to do this? And they say, sure, of course. Mm. There's nothing bizarre here. Mm -hmm. mm. There's nothing crazy here. Right. Nothing destructive here. You're going to be in a covenant with me. You got to eat your kids. No, right. nothing, right. nothing. So they say, sure, we'll do this. Mm. God says, okay. And in that day and age, you enter into a covenant Split an animal in half. Mm -hmm. Animals didn't like covenant ceremonies. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you step in between those and you say, may God do so to me if I ever break our covenant. Mm -hmm. May God come after me with a meat cleaver. Mm -hmm. In five weeks, they've broken the covenant. Right. Mm. From that point on, the only legal responsibility God has is to destroy them. Right. Mm. But for a thousand years, he keeps giving them another chance. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And that's, that's what we've got to focus on. Mm. And the thing that, you know, again, <laughs> turn an Old Testament, Professor Lewis, and you're in trouble. Oh, uh, after the covenant is broken, mm -hmm. God says, okay, Moses, I'm going to keep my promises to Abraham an angel will lead the people into the promised land. But you understand, I can't go with them. Mm. Being who they are and who I am, <laughs> it's like a bale of hay in a blast furnace. Mm. And Moses says, then we're not going. Mm. Then we're not going. I've, I've always thought, if God hadn't loved Moses before that moment, he has to have loved him from then on. Mm. Better the desert with you yeah. than Canaan without you. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Remarkable. Wow. And so... God then, at that point, Exodus chapter 34, he renews the covenant unilaterally. Mm. Mm. That's what's going on in the 34th chapter. And you have that wonderful, it, Moses wants a religious experience. He <laughs> says, uh, God, is it true that I have found favor in your sight and you know, my, know me by name? And God says, yeah. Mm. Could I see your glory? Mm. And God says, I'll show you my goodness. Mm. Yeah. I think that's so, I mean, it, it's such a remarkable part of who God is. I mean, I think one of my meditations this morning, I was thinking how much God, God condescends to meet us where we're at. Yes. And that yes. he uses people that are imperfect and sometimes, you know, vilely imperfect yeah. people uh, to deliver his message. I mean, when we look at somebody like, Martin Luther, you yeah. know, not even 500 years removed from now. Yeah. Some of the things he said regarding women yeah. and Jews, <laughs> we look at that and we think this man was a monster, yeah. you know, or how he, his writings even incited rebellion that ended in bloodshed. Yeah. Like, but God used him. Exactly. And how do we reconcile the fact that God will use very, very flawed institutions and people um, to be able to deliver his glory? It's such a such a condescension. Exactly. Uh, and and that's, ex that's the exact word. And it, it tells us how passionate he is to reach us. Hmm. That, that, but in that, in that Exodus 34, we're told that Moses saw his back, right. but we don't have one word of description of what God's back looked like. Hmm. What we do have are words. Hmm. Right. Yahweh, Yahweh, tender and compassionate. Right. Hmm. Slow to anger. Mm. And I got to stop here and say, this is the, my parade example. When somebody says, I want a really literal translation, I say, there aren't any. 
because slow to anger is he has a really long nose. <laughs> <laughs> what version does that appear in? Oh, that's fantastic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> slow to anger, full of hesed. Mm. That word has no cognate in any other Semitic language. Mm. It is unique to Hebrew. Mm. but it occurs more than 250 times. Wow. And it's one of these for which there is no single English equivalent. Mm. If you've got nine different translations, you've probably got nine different translations of that. Mm. Love, grace, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, steadfast love, unfailing love. You've got to have a sentence to translate it. Mm. Mm. The passionate undying devotion of a superior to an inferior, mm. especially when undeserved. Right. Wow. Wow. And I think, I think the Hebrews had to create a word because mm. mm. you're not going to find any God who's mm. that way. Mm. Right. And that's the thing that those two verses, um, Exodus 34, five and six, uh, they are the most quoted two verse passage by the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. Right. Wow. Directly quoted six times mm -hmm. and alluded to another dozen. Mm -hmm. And it's the, my favorite one is in Jonah. Jonah is sitting there under his dead bush, mm -hmm. furious, and God says, are you mad because uh, yeah. <laughs> you, your bush has died and I've... Dug, I've let these people off. Mm. And Jonah says, you better believe I'm mad. Right. Mm. This is just what I said mm. back in Joppa. I said, mm. you are tender and gracious and slow to anger right. and full of love. Mm. I knew what kind of a God you were. Mm. Makes me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can relate. It's so funny that we're talking about this because I was just kind of recounting, even this morning, um, times that I was mad at God Yes, because I saw him use people that were, were terrible towards me. And I said, God, you let your Holy Spirit <laughs> fall down upon the words and works of this person. And they've been horrible to me. How could you, you know? And, uh, and just having to just bow the knee and realize that you are just uh, and gracious to the just and unjust. The rain falls upon yes. the just and yes. the unjust. Yes. And, and if I look at myself, you know, Eve, I'm a beneficiary of that grace mm -hmm. because if, if we were looking for the perfect person to deliver a <laughs> holy message, it would never happen. It would never get out to anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that, you know, this, this is a long, long no, answer to your yeah. question, but that's the things that I, I would say, uh, look for his patience, mm. look for his mercy, look for the ways he uses a Samson. Mm. Mm. Yeah. This yeah. guy. Yeah. And again, uh, to me, Samson is, is an example of God's incredible patience. Uh, mm -hmm. He let him go and let him go and let him go and let him go. And here's, here's and you, you just, again, the, the marvel of the biblical narrative. He's inching closer and closer. And you say, Samson, no, no, no. Don't you understand what she's doing? Right. <laughs> don't you get it? <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right. Weave my hair into a loom. And she does it. Yeah. 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 And, uh, <laughs> and it's like... And, uh, but, but there it is. Uh, and, and I think, again, when you look at the judges' period... It's a period of incredible chaos. Mm. And, and you look at the ancient world at this time, and that's exactly what was going on. Mm. Everything, everything was up for grabs. Mm. And so uh, God says, hey, I've committed myself to this people. And this people are sinking deeper and deeper into the paganism around them. I don't have many options here. Mm. Looks like Samson's my best shot. Mm. Yeah. It's wild. Sometimes God doesn't have exactly. the best to pick exactly. from. He's like, exactly. I got to work with what I yeah. got, people. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. My, my experience as a college president, uh, I was not in the... Uh, well, first of all, I've had all kinds of experiences of divine guidance. Uh, this was one where it was the thumb in the back. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, I'd been teaching in seminary. I didn't have a lot of administrative experience. Uh, but bingo, here it was. And mm. both Karen and I felt, yeah, we got to do this. Well, I was not in the position, I don't think, longer than about six weeks. Mm. And I knew this is not going to be long term. Mm. Because I am doing something for which I'm not gifted, mm. administration, and it's keeping me from doing that for which I am gifted, teaching. Mm. And, and after three years, God let me go. <laughs> right. Uh, and I've often said, one of my questions when I get to heaven will be, what was that about? Mm. <laughs> yeah. But as I've grown older, I've thought, maybe he'll say, John, I had a slot I had to fill. Mm. You were available. Mm. Mm. Amen. And if that's it, that's, that's good it. enough. Yeah. Wow. That's good enough. Well, this has been really insightful, um, going into the Old Testament and getting your thoughts on this and, yes. and your work on the New Living Translation. And you're going to be around for our next uh, podcast. We're going to talk a little bit about the Bible. Is it historical or is it just like the other mythological tales that we see uh, of an olden days? Great. And so we're so glad to have you. Thank and, you. And uh, we look forward to our next program. So stick around. Well, there you have it, folks. We're so glad you chose to join us today. Stay tuned for our next episode where we try to tackle the often very chilling reputation of the Old Testament and see how the God of the Old Testament compares to his contemporaries in the ancient Near East. As always, we love your feedback, so be sure to subscribe and see you next time.